We have Sean Patrick Flavin over here, and I'm going to check my notes just to make sure I'm doing everything right. Uh, I, uh, he's the Senior Vice President of Theater and Catalog Development at Warner Chapel Music. Um, he has produced 20 cast albums, nine of which are Grammy nominated. Um, in his spare time, he is a music director, arranger, orchestrator, copyist, father of two, um, and uh, he's on the uh, Dramatist Guild Music Committee and the Anti-Piracy Committee. <coughs> um, what scintillating fact did I leave out about you? Wow. Um, <clears throat> come back to Come back to you, okay. <laughs> I should, I should, a scintillating fact that I inevitably will leave out about each person, about each person. Next up, the wonderful Georgia Stitt, composer and lyricist of such shows as the upcoming Snow Child at Arena Stage, uh, Tempest Rock, which we're writing with Hunt Foster, uh, we meaning her and and also the Danger Year, Big Red Sun, Samantha Space Ace Detective, 
Uh, she's on the board of the Lily Awards, uh, which celebrates women in theater, and is also on both the music and the anti-piracy committees of the Toronto Guild. What did I do about? Well, a scintillating fact is that Sean and I went to grad school together, and he's the first person I met in New York City when I moved here. So that we've known each other all the time. Ooh, that is that cover both of them? Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, that's for both of them. Yeah, that's for both of them. Ooh, wow, cool. Next up, we have the one and only Bruce Lazarus. Bruce Lazarus, who is the um, executive director of Sam French. And not only that, he was the director of business and legal affairs at Disney during the uh, reign of the Lion King and Beauty and the Beast and Aida. Um, he is a Tony nominated and Mortel winning producer uh, and Hi, and what else? What else? If you don't tell anybody, I appeared on the Gong Show. <laughs> what? Oh. 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 Just saying. Do we want to know one more fact? What? Or we just? Yes, I did not win. <laughs> but I did not get Gong either. Whoa! Yeah. Nice. Good. 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 And that's tweeted. <laughs> The one in the name is Ryan Scott Oliver, the composer lyricist behind Jasper and Deadland, 35 millimeter, licensed by Samuel French. Uh, Darling, Miss Sharp, Wee Foxes, Rope. You just go into the whole thing. I love it. The whole thing. I'm, I'm just listing my favorites. Thank you. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. What else? What's your What's your scintillating fact? Uh, well, since we're talking about television, and Donald Trump is probably going to be our next president, uh, <laughs> I'm randomly on The Apprentice. Oh, as a music, they had like a Broadway episode, like, and again, I use quotes because the whole thing was in quotes, like, to the entire experience. And yeah, it was like we, we like did music there, and it was like, and watching people who know nothing about Broadway, like, try to like put on a Broadway show was like the funniest thing that's ever happened. And then watching them fight about their knowledge of Broadway, and like someone's like musical education, she says, I have music, as that like that was like her musical education, just like, I have music. Do you have music? I have music. Wow. wow. But we all have music. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, what's a fun fact about you? Yeah. Oh. Fun fact about me. When I was in third grade, I uh, vengefully went to school dressed as a mermaid because I was angry that my third grade teacher didn't let me do mermaids for my science project about undersea creatures. Wow. So I just went as a mermaid. Wow. So, um, <laughs> which is basically what my show Your Vikings is about. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> the, um, so tonight's uh, conversation is about promotion of the musical theater. I think uh, the best thing that we could do uh, is define both of these terms, right? To start off talking about what we're doing here in general and why this is of consequence before we start to realize that maybe what seems fairly dichotomous is in fact a little bit more fused than we think it is. So um, the big uh, first question, let's start with the, the I, I don't want to say name, but like, let's start with the tough step first, which is protection, right? What are we protecting? Well, we're protecting, uh, as Samuel French, we protect our authors' intellectual property rights. Yeah, and what is an intellectual property rights meaning? Well, the, the, the rights to their creative efforts that they've uh, fixed in a format. They've written a play, they've written a libretto, they've written music, um, and the right to, uh, to perform that, and the right to have it performed the way they wrote it. Yeah, and, and the right to get paid for it. And the right to get paid yeah. for it, right? Uh, this the and to choose who who gets to perform it. Yeah, uh, the uh, to just jump off that, especially since you answered this question, there was sort of a well publicized situation that happened last year with uh, with a Sam French client. Do you want to speak about that? And, uh, well, with, there are several, but uh, <laughs> we, uh, we are ver we are very uh, careful and uh, methodical about enforcing our. I think you're referring to the Hands on a Hard Body issue. Um, we had a, a production of Hands on a Hard Body that we licensed to the Theater Under the Stars uh, in Texas. It was the first uh, production in Texas, and the show was about Texas. And um, the uh, artistic director of the theater, who um, uh, was directing that production, decided that he could improve on it by changing around the the order of the songs and some of the uh, dialogue spoken by different characters. Um, we, and then it had sort of the, the nerve, I guess, to uh, invite uh, Amanda Green, the uh, composer, to see opening night. And when she was aghast, he said, 
it's better, right? <gasps> she didn't actually think it was better. In fact, um, I'm so happy you're gasping. <laughs> you're not like, what? <laughs> uh, in fact, uh, we ended up uh, shutting them down. So yeah. it was beyond repair. Yeah, yeah it's interesting. I think that we're, we all we all definitely have experiences with trying to combat this kind of stuff in our daily lives, and I think that's sort of part of what we want to cover here is how pervasive these issues are, and which sort of leads to yeah. I wanted to ask for you guys in particular: have you have you experienced times when people are sort of infringing well, upon your IP? I, I want before I answer that question, I sure. just wanted to to jump onto that point and say that I I grew up in a small town in West Tennessee where. Everybody did that. I mean, you get the you get the musicals and you just sort of edit them the way you wanted to do them. I feel like it was part of our cultural. It was just an understanding that you make them work for your group. And I think I I was in New York before I realized that that wasn't legal. And the, to that I don't know if I'm the only one who has that experience. But growing up as a kid in theater, everything you cut scenes, you right. cut dances, you not do a song, a song was written for a boy, but you give it to a girl, all these sorts of things. And so hearing about something on this large of a scale is shocking. And yet there's a part of me that says, we haven't educated our people to understand that that's wrong. And, and part of what we are doing in, um, on the anti-piracy committee at the Dramatist Guild is, is, is breaking down the issue into several points. And one of them is education, that we have found, with she music in particular, that if you go to the colleges and say to them, hey guys, here's why you can't steal sheet music. Here's what the law is, here's what the cultural norm is, here's what the consequences are, and we're asking you as writers not to do it. A lot of college students go, oh, okay, then I won't do it. But, but in many cases, no one is saying that to them. So I think part, part of the first issue is understanding that there is a, we're, we're battling a, a cultural standard that is not what we want it to be. Well, let me ask a follow-up question. Oh, did you go for it? Oh, no, <clears throat> I was going to rewind in a similar way. <clears throat> Excuse me. The, you know, I think there's a perception, particularly in the last 20 years or so, as the internet has become the, the way we all communicate most of the time, that copyright is some sort of um, antiquated thing that, that hasn't kept up at the time. So to some extent, it's true that the law hasn't been revised in quite some time, and they're now talking about that. But I think it's also important to remember that this goes back to the Constitution. It's in Article One, Section 8, in the powers of Congress, in between things like establishing the post office and the Navy and the power to point money, <laughs> that, that the founding fathers thought it was worthwhile to put that in there. And granted, for the most part, the original concept was less about protecting written works, although a lot of them were writers and intellectuals. It was mainly about patent law and copyright, uh, protecting inventions. Um, but it was also important to put that in there as a fundamental right that if you create something and fix it in a tangible form, that you should be able to profit from it from a certain, for a certain amount of time. And then after a while, it would fall into the public domain and everyone could build on that. But the other sort of common misperception is that it's about uh, stealing ideas or preventing other people from having ideas. And in fact, it's just, the, the, it's not about ideas, it's about that fixed interpretation of the idea and anyone else is free to do their own version of a particular generic plot or situation or chord progression or what have you. But um, the, the people who come up with these things should have the right to make a living from it. Without it, nobody up here would have a job and uh, this company wouldn't exist and my company wouldn't exist and a number of other things. So without that, none of you would have, <clears throat> none of you would have anything. There would be, there's no incentive to create it. So, yeah, I, I just wanted to sort of go back to that idea, and then, because I, I think that's forgotten. I think when you think of whether it's in a community context like that, and I had a somewhat similar situation when I was a kid, um, or something egregious like uh, what you were talking about, you know, there's, there really is something that's part of the culture that needs to remember that this was sort of the founding principle of the country. You know, I, I, say, I just read this recently where it said, Nobody would think, to, uh, people would never walk into a, a store and think they could just take a CD and steal it. But they feel totally free to go on the internet and download the same thing for free with, from a, a rogue website without paying for it. Mm. Yeah. Well, there's a, uh, I think everything shifted when there was no consequence. If you steal a CD, yeah. then the, beeper, the security beeper is going to go off when you walk out of the store. If you steal a CD, they're not going to come bang on your door and arrest you. You know, and, and the it's idea... Still, it, it, still a digital album. 
Yeah, right, the digital level, right. And so it tests our morality, which is really a, a question of like, can you police people's morality? Can you ask people to do the right thing just because you should, that they should? Well, one of the things that licensing companies have found over the last 10 or 15 years is that people rat each other out. You know, if, if a theater or a school or whatever does something and someplace down the road will sometimes talk about, hey, we do the right thing all the time, how come they're getting away with this? We have our sources. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, just while we're on this subject, this is a white paper uh, that we uh, put together last year with the Dramatist Guild. It's called Owning Their Words, and it's exactly about what we're talking about. Um, um, it's uh, understanding the playwright, protecting their work, and how you can help. Um, it's available in the back in hard copy. It's, all avail it's also available at samuelfrench.com. We can just steal it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 totally, it's totally free. It's totally free. But actually, is there a copyright notice on it? I don't actually. Is there a copyright notice on it? I don't think so. I don't think we. Well, you know what? It's copyrighted. The moment it's fixed, that's true. The That's notice right. is only about whether uh, you're going to prevail in court. Not even prevail, but uh, as uh, whether you can collect statutory damages. Uh, but this is copyrighted by merely being fixed on the paper. Uh, in fact, just it's an interesting thing. I think that's what we're talking the, about. The, copy, the, the copyright law uh, under the, the newest law, the 76 Act, uh, no longer requires a registration. As soon as it's fixed in some form, written down, <coughs> spoken into a tape recorder, um, videotaped. videotaped, it's in some fixed form, it is copyrighted. And you own it. How you prove when you did it and all of that are other things, which is why it's good to register. <laughs> And also registering it allows you to get statutory protection uh, for it, uh, to collect statutory damages. Um, but just fixing it, copyrights it. So if somebody said, hey, I wrote that song and you stole it, you would have to be able to prove I wrote it on this day and here's, right. here's the file that's time stamped or whatever. Right. Or, or, just email, it, or email, or email, it, email it to yourself. <clears throat> and if I can jump in just a little bit, and uh, three of us have taught at Pace University, uh, and and work with a lot of college students and kind of know what their cost to bear is with you know, weeks of assignments where they, they don't even necessarily want to work on a song. But I know that our seniors right now have been assigned, each of them has assigned like nine roles, and they have to find two to four songs per role. So like that assignment, if they were going on newmusical.com or you know, and, you know, most of these are, are, are established shows, they're gonna, that's, that's a $140 assignment. That's a $200 assignment if they're to go get the $10 thing. So if they're watching this, they're, they understand what we're saying. And by the way, clearly, I'm on, obviously, I'm on, I'm on our side. But they're going to see this and go, uh-huh, that's nice, but like, what do you want me to do about it? And so I think for me, the next step is, I mean, Spotify is an interesting thing, because Spotify sort of has made a solution for this issue of how easy it is to steal music. And suddenly, like, the artists, we're all getting paid for our cast albums that are put on there. We're getting paid, you know, like, basically. Have you gotten a check for Spotify? No, not yeah, at all. But my point is, is that, like, in theory, in theory, right. we are we are being compensated in some <clears throat> form for it. So the interesting thing to me is that, you know, I remember um, I, I assisted Zena Goldrich and Marcy Heisler years and years ago, and I remember Marcy Heisler saying to me, like, our work is boutique because we're new musical theater writers, and we, you know, we don't necessarily yet have a show on Broadway where there is a vocal selection that these kids can get anywhere. Our work is boutique, so therefore we can charge. Eight, nine, ten, or some of us are charging fifteen dollars for us for one single song, and I I think everyone understands, and no one would dispute that like we deserve to be paid for that work. But I think the question is how is it, and I'm just asking this question like is it a case of pricing? Like how for young people? I'm specifically referring to young people. Like how did we all how did we all decide who decided that that that, that the average price of a piece of sheet music of a new musical theater, let's say, is Nine or ten dollars, if we can agree on that for a second. Well, it's anywhere from I'd say three ninety-five to fifteen dollars for a piece, of, right. depending on where you buy it and right. who's publishing it. Right, right, right. Um, I just I want to speak to there Please, is yeah. um, there is and, and those of you who are a little bit more educated in the legalities of this can correct me, but there is a fair use clause that covers education. I, mean, I think it's important to say that that if you are um, that if you are in a class. Mm -hmm. 
I think I can say you can, you're allowed to photocopy right. that music for the purposes of your class right. and for the purposes of education. Oh. The, if you're really being strict about the law, then as a teacher you can hand out the photocopies of sheet music. You're expected to take it back up at the end I of see. class. Okay. If a student then takes that piece of music out into the world and mm -hmm. uses it for auditions or in a concert or right. something like that, then they're expected to buy a copy. Right. But if you're using it for the purposes of education, it right. falls under fair Am I right when I say that? Everybody's well, <laughs> fairness is a defense. Right. It's not a. It, it's not. It, it's not proact. I mean, it's not uh, proactive. I can't think of the word I want. If someone sues you, you can say it's fair use. But yes, there's something that says teachers can use it for educational purposes. The, the question, and I'll let Sean jump in, is how far does that go? Because we just had a similar situation where uh, a school in Oakland did the whiz. Mm didn't license it, didn't pay royalties, and their claim was, we did it in a school. And therefore, it's for educational purposes, and it's covered by fair use. And we went did all the way, they sold tickets, yeah, they sell sell tickets yeah. and, and um, um, we, um, we took it all the way up to the school board, and the school board, the Oakland County School Board's attorneys said, take us to court, and we said it's fair use. But, all right. Oh, it's a stunt. But the school, I mean, the, the bottom line, that is the school profit. You know, in, right. you know, in the educational situation, no one is profiting except the minds of the young people. Right. But the moment that you charge tickets for it, that's a completely separate thing. And I would think you could <clears throat> make that case if they hadn't sold tickets, and they right, only right. did it for their, within the school. But or donation, I mean, yeah. make it donation-based. But again, we're no, trying it, to it, create it, a legal... Yeah, I no, think the no. fair use <clears throat> doctrine in this area is about a classroom use, mm -hmm. not yeah. about... I agree right. with you. Yeah. yeah, this makes sense. I think it's an interesting point you raised specifically because in these worlds you have um, in the, the proponents for uh, anti-copyright right. um, or, or who are, I shouldn't say anti-copyright, but who are... Um, Information should be free. Uh, yes. <clears throat> uh, tend to be the two ends of that spectrum right. that you just outlined. Academics who spend their entire lives living in a situation where perhaps they're not compensated right. the way they would in the, in the private sector, but at the same time, they have access to tremendous amounts of information. Your students probably don't go buy sheet music for $150, they photocopy it out of the library. Right. And I imagine Pace being a school right. that has a lot of right. performing arts stuff, they have that stuff right. in the library, right? Um, so it tends to be those, those academics who feel like, you know, well, well, I'm just building on someone else's ideas. And it's one thing to have it be some sort of academic commentary or classroom use mm -hmm. or something like that. But when that expands into the wider world and say, you know, well, all this should be free. Well, how do you think those books got into your library? Right. Somebody was selling them. Um, on the other hand, you have certain technology companies, uh, and I'm not picking on any particular one, uh, but there are, you know, their feeling seems to be that even though their entire business is the delivery of copyrighted material, whether it's music or movies or what have you, that they should pay as little as possible for that material that they're delivering. Um, and keep the profits. So it becomes very challenging in that way. At the same time, you can have things like, you know, Spotify does at least pay. Um, they do have discount subscriptions for college students. Um, and so, and that does trickle down. It, obviously, it's not the same as people are making on a download or certainly on a $15 piece of sheet music or whatever. But it, it is these, these two sort of groups, both of which have large lobbying components right. who are who are going to be influencing this discussion we have about what copyright law is going to be in the next 20 years. Well, I mean, the thing that you bring up is the difference between knowledge and entertainment. Right. And like when, and I'm glad that Georgia, you clarified that like when, when this is for education and when it's for a student to practice a role to learn how to better themselves as a performer, right, that's different than when you perform at 54 Below and you're presenting someone's song and people, money is changing hands and the quality of the venue, the quality of the evening, the quality of the experience is predicated on the quality of the material, the entertainment value of the material. And in that sense, I mean, there's, there's, it's totally inexcusable. And in that scenario, most of the time, the, the songwriter is not making much, if any, money from that event, unless it's their own, con I'm not picking on 54 Below no, either, no, no, totally. but any venue, if you're doing a cab it's one thing if you're doing a cabaret concert of your own work, yeah. and it's just your work, you may get paid something for it. But if it's one song out of right. 20, you're probably not, other than whatever, trickles down through the performing rights society. Yeah. So right. Right. Um, 
in that case, you know, the, the transaction that's happening is not necessarily benefiting the songwriter. And the right. exposure that you're getting may be valuable on one hand, right. but, but at some not, point it's not, especially when you're at the place where they're stealing your sheet music right. and trading it, and, and you can post on something and say, hey, I'm looking for this song by this person, and, it's, and someone immediately is there to respond. At that point, that exposure is probably not necessarily as useful. Right, and you're, yes, but it's the opposite of useful. You're right. But you're not, a, in other words, the, the presumption that you know, oh, you should just make your money somewhere else right. by touring. You know, no one in this business is is Beyonce. Right. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you uh, have Beyonce? Is not Beyonce anymore? Can you also just move away from the from the pure financials of it for a second, because we also touched on this intellectual property issue, which I think is also paramount. What would you say to a What would you say to an organization that said, "Look, I really want to do show X, but we don't have this. We don't have enough women." Or we don't have enough of this race, or we don't have enough, or we can, we don't have enough sopranos, and therefore we're gonna recraft it. And the issue is either don't you want us to do this show? Don't you want us to do this show? We're just gonna make it work for us. Well, that depends on the author. Some authors will say, "Great, do it any way you like. I don't care what you do with it. Do with it." And others will say, "I'm sorry, this must be performed by people of this race." Must be performed the way I wrote it, or don't do it. It's you know there's there are thousands of shows out there. There are plenty of shows. I'll help you find another show. <laughs> don't do my show because I don't want it done that way. Right? Or with the author, <laughs> right? Or with the print, and and um, that's the author's prerogative. Mm -hmm. This poses an interesting question because, like you know, and you can speak to this in terms of what you license. A show like Chicago, as an example. Is there something in the licensable materials which stipulates the ethnicity of any of these characters? I might, I suspect it probably doesn't, but I would imagine in a show like Hairspray or Ragtime, race plays a really, really, really pivotal part. And I would be interested to know, is it, is it just assumed that, that licensing groups, especially like high schools, are, are going to be aware that Cole House and Sarah ought to be black? Or is it actually in the licensable materials? Like these are the stipulations so that, of that. That's not a Samuel French show, so I can't right. speak to that one in particular. But just for example, uh, we represent the August Wilson Century Cycle, and all of those characters are African American, and they must be played by African Americans. They must be, uh, uh, and and um, they cannot be played by uh, people in blackface. And it doesn't say that in the libretto. It does. Obviously, I don't know that. It. And, and but where it really gets a little right. more interesting, or at least I hadn't really thought about it for a long time, was you know people play Asian characters mm -hmm. that are not Asian, mm -hmm. and so it's really it's yellow, that. yellow face, <laughs> and, or that's what they call it. I don't actually yeah. like that, but but um, but that's not appropriate either. Mm -hmm. um, now there are some authors who might say it's fine. But again, that's their prerogative. Absolutely. Yeah, I just thought it was worth articulating also. And there are productions in foreign countries too, where right. they're in particular countries where it's predominantly Japanese, for instance, and so then they have different traditions about doing shows with different races as well. So you have to adapt to those situations. But I mean, or not, or not, or not. Yeah, and I think central to this is to remember that it's also the it's the writer or the writer's representation that ultimately is able to make this decision based on how they want their piece to be reflected. Yeah. And it's um, and and I think it's fair to say that a lot of writers are down to have that conversation in the first place and want to. I re I received just recently um, a request for to do a, an academic, purely academic performance of a show of mine for um, for for no dollars, and I said go for it because that sounds like. I know how much you will benefit from it versus how much I will benefit from it, and this makes sense. But if the same production were somewhere in a much bigger venue, then it would be a different conversation. Or if they hadn't asked. Or if they hadn't asked, it would right. be entirely different. Right. Yeah. It's, a, it's like, it, this comes down to something that's a little bit more nebulous and karmic yeah. than, than anything else. Yeah. And just so you know, all of these things tend to be in our license, whether they can, you know, the fact that they cannot make changes to the script uh, or interpolate the music or change the race of the characters, or, or, or cut characters, or all of that. And you'd be surprised how many people, when confronted with it, go, oh, I, I, didn't, I didn't read it. I didn't know it was in the contract. Which is, brings up another point which we tried to deal with last year. Um, I wanted to have the 
It, it occurred to, 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 to us that the managing director of a theater who signs the contract is not the director of the play. And the director of the play may never have seen that contract. Mm -hmm. And so we wanted to have the director have to sign that they read mm -hmm. the license. The um, SDC, the Society of Directors and Choreographers, um, objected to that as a potential collective bargaining issue. And so it didn't wow. go very far. But really, it's, it's interesting to note that the director doesn't necessarily read it. Mm -hmm. We at the, um, the Anti-Piracy Committee have a new document that we have created that um, asks at auditions, asks the casting directors, and then on the first day of rehearsal, asks the stage directors to sign a document that's, that basically is a pledge saying that they won't photocopy the music and they won't share it beyond the needs of this rehearsal. And it has been approved by Equity and the SSDC. I don't know about SDC, Equity. SDC, right. Equity yeah. approved it. And so we, what we're trying to do is make it part of the new standard that on the first day, of, that first of all, that in casting, you know, you have to hand out your material mm -hmm. for people to learn it for auditions and callbacks and sort of that, and then that gets proliferated and those sides get photocopied and thrown on the internet and suddenly this first draft of a song that you still haven't rewritten makes its way out into the world and people show up singing it on auditions and you're like, how did you get this mm -hmm. music? And it's because of the audition process in some cases. Um, and so what we're doing is asking for a pledge from casting directors and the auditioners and that sort of thing saying that they won't do that. And then also for the first day of rehearsal. So we're trying to make that part of the package. We've, we've, we've also been met with some resistance so far, but mostly it's people just saying, what is this? I'm not used to signing this in my day one packet. And, um, and then us have not, our, our representatives saying, it's been approved, it's all legit. So that's new. Well, this and I. This is a question that I have, and, and as I've only just recently graduated, because I think we have the same people doing our website, and like they dealt with the watermark. Like I was like, I was like, I want my music coded when someone purchases it, and the same way they got on music notes, this this has been purchased for whatever. It's so easy now, in the same way that it's easy to steal music, it's yep. also just <laughs> as easy to throw the PDF. You know, no matter what version of the reading you're doing, no matter who, no matter if it's Telsey, no, literally any situation you can suddenly code all of the information with a watermark that goes straight across it that's not gonna be obtrusive. Everyone can still read the whole thing, which says anywhere from this is for auditions on this day by this casting agency, or this is the second reading that is happening on this date. And then suddenly there's some accountability because you know when that sheet music gets out of your hands, you know that it's only these nine people or these 20 people, and that may seem like a large amount, but it also, it, it does have some accountability in terms of where did the sheet music get out, and it, and, it, and it sits there forever. And I think that's that's that is another really simple way um, to make sure that our music doesn't get <coughs> too far out of our hands. Well, this is also a very natural segue to this other half of the conversation, which is about promotion. Which is to say, like, lest we have any con confusion that writers sit in a room holding the material. Don't sing my music. <laughs> <laughs> angry. Don't do it. I don't know about you guys, but I would say ninety percent of my working time is spent like vomiting out material to try to get people to do it. Right. You know, and uh, and in you know a variety of different capacities and a variety of different media. So I'm curious to talk uh, to talk also about oh for you guys, A, how you how you promote your own material and for you guys how you receive promoted material <laughs> and or how you promote your own set of materials once they have sort of been through your channel. I open it. <laughs> you, you, you look like you were taking a giant breath, so I'll... I, I don't know where to start. You, you can start. I will start. I will start. <laughs> Please jump in. Um, in terms of promoting materials, I mean, um, you know, if, at, at this stage, I will say, and I think this is the stage where a lot of right, where a lot of us are, 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 are at, it has to be through concerts, it has to be through small venues. And, you know, the worst thing about it is that suddenly then we get labeled as, like, concert writers, and, that's, and none of us are doing it. None of us are writing songs just so they can be in contest. I mean, I, for me, like, I've written, I can count on one, on two hands, the number of, like, standalone cabaret songs I've ever written. Like, I just don't do that. I write shows for musicals. I'm a dramatist. That is what I do. But sometimes, when I want to have a seven-piece band, the, the most cost-effective way is to do it in a concert setting. The sound is going to be great. It's, it's going to be a lovely-looking venue. You're going to get a lovely performer performing it. It makes a whole lot of sense. And then, you know, that goes on the YouTube. And uh, you know, and then at that point, you know, it's and it's like all the sheet music that I've sold. It's interesting. I, I just um, after Jasper and Dylan, we I had eight, you know, made a vocal selections of it, and there were two songs that don't have YouTube's, 
and those have exactly zero purchases. Mm -hmm. All the other ones that have YouTubes are selling very, very well. And so I'm like, okay, note to self, if I ever want these two things to be sold, I have to find some reason to have these two things recorded or performed ASAP. Well, this is also interesting that Jasper and Didland being, you know, that songs on YouTube would correlate to sheet music sales. Yeah. But generally, how, two points to this question. For sure. How important are sheet music sales in your professional lives in terms of the, like, the great revenue stream of what you have? And second of all, did, did having, doing Jasper in concert or did doing the concert versions of your work, does that seem to lead to production? Or does that just mostly lead to sheet music sales? I don't mean this, this to be a leading question. This sure, is no, a real question. absolutely. In terms of like how much does sheet music, in, in a, no matter how my career has, has moved, sheet music has never been more than 10% of my income. Uh, you know, and initially the other 90% was from like other things like survival jobs that I was doing that were now just writing and like commissions and like just the writing thing. But it, sheet music has never been more than than ten percent, and and it's nice. I mean, it's a nice little bump, but like, um, it's 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 important. That's why for me, it's like I and when we talk about like what we're doing in our spare time, you know, I'm spending the rest of the time writing and hustling and doing all of that. And to answer your other question, um, I would say, I, I, yeah, I would say the the, the that that the concert work. Um, has I, I can say that it has direct, directly related to next steps in production. Sometimes yes, sometimes we'll have a libretto. Some will have a libretto, but in the time that they receive the libretto, to the time they make a decision about whether or not they want to do it, I probably have an opportunity for them to actually see the work in concert or something like that. It's not essential, but I would also say it's really helpful, especially for the producers who lack maybe at the, the vision you'd hope that they would have, just reading something off the page and just listening to a demo. Do you feel like that is true for, for you guys too, from a producerial end of things, that, that you that you find things in concerts and then you want to elevate it to the next level? Um, from from a licensing standpoint, it's you know it, it's I think sometimes we'll we'll hear something or hear about something that will pique our curiosity and we will follow it. But in all honesty, until it has some sort of higher level production, off-Broadway, Broadway, a large regional theater, it's difficult to license it, no matter how good it is, because there's just no heat around it. And the amount of marketing energy it takes to create awareness of it just doesn't sort of, yeah. just doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. So um, the, the best thing you can do is, is to get a new Mm. Yeah. I can speak to you. I'll let you go in a minute, but uh, I'll let you speak. Um, <laughs> there, uh, I did spend. You thank you. I did spend the first few years in New York writing standalone songs and all kinds. Of, I wrote choral music and art songs and um, and not shows. Thing. I mean, I was always sort of writing a show, but I was. I, I found a more immediate gratification in writing a song, finishing the sheet music, selling it, having somebody perform it, ultimately making a YouTube video. And what I learned is that there is no income stream in any of that. That it is that you have to write the show if you're going in, in this end of the business. I mean, certainly there are art song composers and there are choral music composers and that sort of thing. But if you're in this line of the business, you have you have to finish the show. My experience has been that all of that groundwork, making albums, doing concerts, getting things on YouTube, leads to the way people perceive you in the world and the way people treat you as a professional. And, oh, I've heard of you, I know you're a writer, I've heard good things about you, I, I heard that one song that you did, I, that one thing showed up in my class, I coached it, and they start to know you. In the absence of that, I don't know how you, yeah. I don't know how you get your work out there. So it is a very large um, wheel of self-promotion <coughs> that ultimately, I, I have gotten commissions specifically, and probably my agent, out of all of that public performing work, can't imagine where I would be had I not done it, right. but I, I have never gotten a production of a show. Um, I think you have to have the show to sell too, right up to the point. I do now. But it's yeah, you have to have that thing that you're going to sell because all that other activity, as both of you said, if you're just doing, even if you dedicate yourself to just writing amazing standalone songs and getting them performed in nice places by great singers with videos and all that. It's not going to sell it. It puts your name in the world, but they have to, then they say, okay, what's the show? Um, uh, 
in my main job, we, we come at uh, the career a little bit earlier than, than they do in licensing. Um, and so I, I do sign people mostly who have had major productions of their work, but I also occasionally sign people who are earlier in their career um, who have either uh, a show or a show plus some work in another genre, um, adult contemporary pop or folk or that sort of thing. Um, because there has to be, in, in the music publishing world, there has to be an income stream in order for me to justify the work that I'm going to spend with the writer. Um, even if, <clears throat> whether that's early developmental work or um, helping them you know, get a show to the finish line or once they've got the show that's about to be produced, figure out how we're going to uh, get the music out there in other ways. Um, recordings, shoot music, concerts, film and TV, advertising, video games, what have you. Um, so it's rare that somebody comes to me with, here's a few songs I've written, you know, make me a pop star. That, that's not going to happen. Um, particularly, for, <clears throat> me, particularly for people who are mostly write in theater, because theater writers who think they're pop writers are not pop writers. Um, you know, it was an education for me as well when I started working at Warner. <clears throat> Because, you know, the, I haven't listened to it, especially in New York. People don't listen to the radio. And now I do because I live in Westchester and I have a car and I drive around. But, and I work in a place surrounded by a &R people who do what I do but in other genres. And so, you know, the, the theater definition of pop music is not pop music. Um, they are two very different things with very different skill sets. Mm -hmm. One is not, certainly not better than the other. I t tend to like theater music more, but, you know, mm -hmm. it's fine. So, I think... Um, you know, they have to have something that I can sell, just like later on in the chain, they have to have something that Bruce can sell. Mm. Can I just add one thing for that? Um, <clears throat> in selling a show that we represent, it is very helpful to have a cast album, demos, things, because that's what the ultimate licensee, the, the theater out in the Milwaukee or whatever, they want to know what, you know, they need to hear it. Uh, just getting it off the page is very difficult. Uh, just providing them the sheet music. They, they're not going to, we're not going to get enough yes decisions based on that. So um, when we're picking up a musical, it's very important to us that there's a cast album. Yeah. One of the things I just want to add about the YouTube thing, and, and it's very easy for all of us, and I'm, I'm as guilty of this, I mean, I actually don't watch YouTube videos of my, my own work, like, you know, when someone when someone from a college says, like, I sang your song, here's a video, like, I'll watch the beginning to make sure it happened, and then I'll watch the end to make sure they finish it, and they got through. <laughs> but, like, it's like a little bit like nanny cam, like, you're watching, like, the nanny, like, play with your baby, and you're like, no, she doesn't like that kind of food, like, don't touch my baby. <laughs> but, <laughs> but <laughs> yes, okay, that's right. My dog, yeah, Doug Baker. Um, but, but I want to say, like, the thing is, is that, like, you know, YouTube does have a tremendous amount of power, and we're not even done seeing its, its power. And the main point of that is that us musical theater writers have been doing this for five, five, 15, 20 years, right? You know, whatever, whatever that number is. YouTube was, you know, I felt like we got really popular in 2007, 2008. Please tell me if my year is wrong. In any case, you know, it's been almost a decade that YouTube's sort of been around. And what's interesting is those 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 year olds who like started to see our work when they were like little musical theater geeks like we all were when we were kids doing community theater and all that stuff. And YouTube is suddenly at their fingertips in the middle of Nebraska and they're watching and they feel like they're a part of our community because they can see all of our names, they know exactly who we are, they know they feel as close to us as anyone else in the entire country. They, don't they have can to. write to us on Twitter, they can write to us Absolutely. on websites. And they, they feel they access. feel they feel connected to us. And and I think the biggest point is that in time, they, some, many of them do move to New York, and they're already like fans of ours, you know, and have been for years. And we're like, I didn't even know that you knew that we existed. And then they become the assistant to the lit manager at, <laughs> you know, this place or that place, and they're, you know, what I mean, like that, and that, and then eventually they're going to become the managing directors, and 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 they'll have known about us for 15 or 20 years. And I do think that 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 is that there is that there is power there. It's not. I mean, you're what you guys were saying. Totally, you're not going to get production. From the concert or from the YouTube video, but there is this other sort of grassrootsy kind of power associated with YouTube now. That is, that is, that is a power that I think wasn't there 30 years ago. You had to be in New York. You had to be seeing people at <coughs> piano bars, and that's no longer the case. Well, the you know? visual is very powerful because yeah. you know, I grew up listening to past albums right. and imagining what that was, right. what the shows were like, and seeing some. 
either in school or tours right. or that sort of thing. Waiting until the Tonys come on. Right. <clears throat> uh, so it is the We Were That Kid thing yeah. from Tom Glenn's song. But it's you know having that, whether it's a you know, bootleg of something or a real video yeah. of somebody doing a song in a concert, you know, being able to see someone do that is a very powerful thing. I programmed so. entire concerts just because I wanted the YouTube videos. Yeah. I knew that I wasn't going to make any money of my songs. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I booked a venue, hired singers, rehearsed them, hired a band, yeah. written orchestrations, done the entire concert, made zero dollars because I knew that there was going to be video content that would then become more valuable to me than Absolutely. any Made zero dollars, you probably won't yeah. It probably cost me money, yeah. yeah. So, I have an interesting situation which I would, uh, I would love all of you to comment on. So, there were certain um, composers, lyricists, um, that are Samuel French clients that say, if it's on YouTube, I want you to take it down. I'm not being paid for it. I want it down. Of a production of a, of a well of a song, but a song from a from a fully staged yeah, production. Yes. Oh, okay. say, say yes, or even a. Um, and if you do take it down, um, the um, the YouTube account is um, suspended for six months. And we get calls from parents going, you took down all my family videos, mm -hmm. you know, for, and, and I can't get it back for six months. And if it actually happens, I think three times, they wipe out the account and they're gone. Um, so uh, this particular uh, person I spoke to said, well, good. They should know that when they're stealing people's material, there's a penalty for it. On the other hand, I have a composer lyricist who says, they want to do my work, they want to see my Great, whatever they do is fine. I'm curious to see what they do with it. It's great. And you, so there's both ends of the spectrum, and we are a bit caught in the middle. Um, we can't make a global decision to take down all the videos. Because some people will say, oh, what are you doing? Why? You know, you're doing it in my name, in a way. Correct. And it's not nice. And other people will say, what do you mean you're not taking it down? You're supposed to be protecting my work. Caught in, caught in the middle there a little bit. Um, which to me begs a, a, a bigger question, which is, if you really looked at how much money you make from sheet music, and I know some people make a considerable amount of money from sheet music. You know, if, you, if, if, you're, if you're making, if your share after it's published or whatever is a few dollars a sheet, and you sell a thousand sheets, so you've made three thousand dollars, but if out of those 3,000 things that were stolen, someone, it, it drifts into some lit manager's office, or somebody did it in college, or somebody loved it, and says, hey, I want to do this show. That one license is worth 10, 20, 30, $50,000 potentially, and maybe it leads to more licenses. Is it a trade-off? Is it worth letting them take it in order to get the license? Now, we're in the business of protecting people's property. So we're, you know, if, if, if we go after it and we have it taken down and we make sure, or we do our best to make sure that people aren't stealing it. But I wonder sometimes if it's in the best interest of the client, in their best financial interest. You're really asking two different questions though. One is saying, do you mind if someone takes a video of your song? And the second is, do you want to give away your sheet music for free or let people steal it in order to get performances? Well, I'm, 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 not, I'm not asking them to do that. I'm, I'm, well, I guess I'm asking the question is, is it maybe a good uh, promotional tactic to let people have your sheet music? Because the money's not in the sheet music. The money's in the production. Well, there certainly are, like, there's the model, like Radiohead. There, there, there are the models, and now I can't remember her name, the artist who gives away all of the music. Um, anyway, uh, there, are, there certainly are models in the pop world of people who think of sheet music as a loss leader or as those performances as a loss leader against a greater end. I think, I think even if you could come around to believing that that was the case, it's hard to quantify it in a way that sets the bar there for everything else. I have um, a, a choral piece that is published and, um, and I found a YouTube video where somebody had made like, here's the alto part, here's the soprano part, here's, here's the piano part, here's what it sounds like when they're all together. Which I thought, oh, that's so nice that he did that. And then I realized he was selling them for 99 cents. Like, you can download them for, 
your choir, and then they're just made. And then I Googled, looked further into who he was, and he does this for choral music. That's what he does. His business is uh, benefiting from what all of our work. Um, and so I have another friend who's a choral music director, uh, composer, and I wrote him and I said, do you know about this guy? What, he's got your music up here too. What do you do? And he said, oh yeah, we know about that guy. We, um, we, don't, we don't take him down because we, but we figure he actually generates business for us that because those videos exist, people find our songs and they come to us. So I have the same ethical question. Like, do I, do I ask him to take down my music because he's charging for it? What I really should do is make him license it. Yeah. I should just or make him license it. Right, yeah. you sell 99 cents, you can license that from me and here's the piece. Right. But are we gonna, we're gonna go after every single person individually right. that's doing that? Is that what your job is because you're representing? Like, are we, who's going after every person that's infringing on my copyright? But also, where do you draw the line? If you say, okay, well, we're not making much from our sheet music, so and the goal is to get grant rights licenses because that's more lucrative. Okay, well, then are we not making enough from our recordings of our cast albums? The, really, the goal is to get someone to do the show. So if we've done this cast album, should we just give that away because that's going to make them do the, I mean, how far do you go in giving away a long well, chain in order to get the, the one thing at the end that's more lucrative than the other things in the aggregate, but still... I mean, you can, of course, choose to give away whatever you choose to give away, and whether you're going to be able to whack a mole everybody who steals it, you're not. I think that there's an assumption for me, like, <clears throat> when we talk about, like, the price of the sheet music and, like, it's $9 or $10 or whatever, for me, I just have this assumption that that's, they're not only paying for the sheet music, but they're also, because this is for me, that they're also paying for at least one public performance. You know, again, because like, like what sometimes someone will say, "Hey, I want to perform this at my university. How much would that cost me?" And it's like basically the cost of the sheet music as well. I mean, the one, you know, song. The one song, one performance at some event. Like oh, they yeah. tell me what the ticket price is. I'm like, this is like an eight dollar license. Do you know what I mean? Like so. So for me, and when I think about like when I when I one time I did the math when I look at like all the sheet music that music that is purchased, and then I looked on YouTube to see all of the in one year all of the performances that were done. I was kind of like this. This pretty much evens out. This like kind of adds up a little. Bit. When you think about it, well, you wouldn't charge them for the performance of the song anyway. That would be covered by the school's ask after being my license. Right, 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 right. right. <clears throat> so, I mean, if it were a show, that's a right. different story. Right. But, yeah, there's a presumption that if they buy the sheet music, they can perform the show. Right. Let me just jump in real fast because we're running short on time, and I want to make sure that we have a chance to talk to you guys and see if you have any questions from the panel. Slash, this is out to the internet also, which you can do on Twitter um, uh, with the hashtag MusicalSweet. Um, uh, do we have any any sort of questions from you guys? Things that we want to address? Yeah. I have a question when it comes to like cabaret performance, which is pretty big in the city. There's a ton mm -hmm. of cabaret rooms. I don't think most of them are paying any kind of rates. Um, Maybe 54 Below. I don't know. No, they do. They I do mean, there's a license, an ASCAP or BMI mm -hmm. license that they pay so in order to be in business. And so, as I'm a member of ASCAP, and so. If I know that somebody's performing my piece in a cabaret, I add it to, I keep yeah. a running list of, of throughout the year of where my music is performed. And I usually, before the deadline, do a YouTube search and see if I can yeah. find any that I don't know about, which I always do. Um, I ask my, on Twitter, I usually say to people, hey, have you performed my song publicly? If so, just let me know because I can get money for it. But because that venue has paid its ASCAP or BMI or CSEC license, yeah. um, then ultimately I can apply to get a piece of the trickle down economics back from yeah. it. And, and just so you know, ASCAP has agents that go out to every restaurant and every bar and every bowling alley demanding payment and demanding that they get a license. Um, so, how, how they figure it out, I don't know anymore. It's, yeah. so it's, it's some algorithm. Well, it's actually, and actually, I can sort of speak to this a little bit. Um, so, Michael Kirker at ASCAP, the program is called ASCAP Plus, um, also a member of ASCAP, and it's it's. The program itself is basically like once you start doing it, they give you a set amount of money, whatever, based on like you make that, you show them the list, like you show them the receipts, like this is what I, you know programs are, are are listing, and then as long as you keep showing that your that more pe more and more people are doing it every year, usually the amount gets a little bit higher. And when the, in order to figure it out, they basically just go, how much did we give you last year? All right, we're going to bump you 15, 20 percent usually. I mean, assuming that your your career seems to also be doing that. So it's actually a really great program, and a lot of young writers. <clears throat> kind of be, you know, especially when the starting fee can be 100, 200, even 500 dollars. It's a lot of money for a 22-year-old musical theater writer to be making if they have get their work performed. You know, ASCAP and BMI used to also, I mean, still 
uh, pay for radio play. And they used to collect logs from the radio stations. What songs did you play every day? And they would, I don't think they do, I, I know yeah, that. They, they, they do it, they, they, they do that, but they mostly do it through fingerprinting technology. So they know what songs are being played on the radio. Do they try to use them? Uh, yeah, to some extent. Yeah, I'm not exactly sure of the mechanism. For is it, YouTube an ask as a small performance rate? Uh, some t it depends who the publisher is. Um, the larger publishers have direct deals with YouTube. Um, some of the others go through the PRs. Which brings a question I have about YouTube. Have you guys seen any money from YouTube? Like, what if something goes crazy nuts viral? You know, like somebody sees it and get a million views. Well, I, I, I can I can speak to Jonathan Miguel has a song called Quiet, and I think it's been. Viewed a performance by Natalie Weiss is like, I mean, last I checked, it was like in the hundreds and hundreds of thousands. And I know it's like a huge seller on EnglishSchoolDay.com. So, I mean, I, I the amount he amount money he's made on just that one song, and we all have like our hits, but like because of those YouTube performances, there's definitely a direct correlation in terms of how popular that song is and how much money you get back. If you're asking, but I don't think you get a check, check from YouTube. Oh, no, no, right. No. You, you don't get anything directly from YouTube. But, okay. but you can. You should. You, you can. can. You can monetize you have to, it. You have to register. Oh, and, you know, like, it's right, right. Yeah. Yeah. put ads on it. Yeah. Depends on which ads no, you're interested in. But even without the ads, if it's uh, the, Without the ads, you should get something. With the ads, you get more. But, interesting. Yeah. It's, and it depends on what type of ad runs around. And obviously, if it's more, the more popular the video gets, the more the ad algorithm happens, yeah, other ads But around. the ad is being, the ad money is being paid to the person who posted it. You as a publisher are collecting on, perf on oh, the thing. performance, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, currently yeah, I don't really speak to that. If, <laughs> okay. if you put a song it's, up, it's you put a song yeah. for your concert, and you got, you know, I don't know, Azalea Banks or uh, you know, Miley Cyrus to sing one of Ryan Scholar's songs, and it gets 10 million views on YouTube, YouTube. You put ads on it, all of a sudden you're making, you know, thirty, twenty, forty, fifty thousand dollars that year in ad sales. Right. Like you're the uploader, you get that ad money. Right. The where, does that, the where does that money go? In other words, like, is there is it just that uploader's money? Well, because I think well, one thing I think that from, from YouTube's perspective is that when you upload a video, you have like you click a box or something that says something to the effect of like this is. Right. I own. Well, that's why your clients are saying yeah. take it down because somebody <clears throat> can make money off of it. Right. It's not me. New problem. Yeah. New problem. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Ask this Twitter question. Yes, we have a question from Twitter. Um, he said that in today's world, it's such a DIY, one-man show business thing. How do you balance writing your music, doing that self-promotion, <coughs> networking? Like, what advice do you have to people that are having to do that? And you talked a little bit about this earlier, but you know, in a short, tweeterific answer. How yeah. would you I'm, see? I'm wondering if Sam shouldn't answer that since he's the the king of social media. Oh, I don't know about that. I don't. The, in terms of the, the question is more. In terms of promoting your, how do you balance both like your time and energy in terms of creating your work, but also making sure that it's being promoted and networking it. Just. I think that's balance. an ongoing art for your whole life. I think that's always a struggle. You know, certainly, I definitely looked at like I, the first time I read it, wrote a show was in college because in college I had a very set schedule and um, and had free time that I didn't know I was going to lose <laughs> once I became a real person. And um, and then upon when that happened, then the next show that I wrote was because of a deadline that I had. So everything cleared out and I met the deadline. And subsequent to that, um, it's challenging because you end up with uh, you end up with survival jobs that you have to take, especially when people aren't paying you money that you deserve, <laughs> you know, um, it, that, that impacts the amount of time that you have. Um, there are some really, really incredible organizations um, that exist uh, solely to give writers the space and the time to focus on their craft for a certain amount of time. Um, uh, the O'Neill uh, Theater Center, uh, Goodspeed has an incredible one. Running Dear Music the Theater Lab, where Ryan and I were earlier this year. These are writers' retreats. Ryan right? Beck writers' retreats. There's a, this amazing programs where they allow you to go for a certain amount of time and just focus on your material. For people who are really writing all the time, those are invaluable. They take you away from the coffee dates and from the the meetings and the concerts and whatever else, and allow you to focus on your craft. But um, but that's really a, but then the rest of it's a, 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 a balancing act. And to make this to make this jump, where Ryan is talking about now, primarily a lot of his career is based on his writing projects and his commissions. Um, uh, 
which is fantastic and the goal that we all share, but making that jump between, okay, I'm not going to take music direction jobs. Right. I'm not going to take um, these arrangement jobs. I'm not going to take the money that is coming to me right now. This is part of what I think is also really important to understand about piracy is, um, and write it, writers and the writer life in general is that we don't get paid for writing. We get, we get paid for having written. And so, for selling a product, for selling a product, product that you've already invested all of this time and emotional energy into, and um, I think you had mentioned before that your that you do a draft in six months. Into that, I say Godspeed because <laughs> wow. my, my drafts are like I don't know how long does it take you to make much a draft? longer than six months. Much longer than six months, and that's the amount of time that we're putting focused energy into what we're writing. So, um, so that is all uncompensated <clears throat> time that we are doing in the hope that someday somebody will want to turn that into a thing. It's different when you start getting a commission. You yeah. know, the commissions give you upfront money, and, right. um, and there it can be not-for-profit commissions or commercial, mm -hmm. commercial commissions, and so that does change the game a little bit. But I think you have to have been doing it long enough to be a person that gets a commission. You yeah. Know? Yeah. I think it's important, though, to note that that never changes. It just right. depends on what depends on how your that balance of time never changes. I had a meeting earlier today with one of my most successful clients his entire team, his agent, his manager, his publicist, his financial planner, um, <clears throat> and he's doing very well, but he's also spending just as much time trying to figure out how to promote his work in a bigger way than most of us are, and still have time to write. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it's in his case, it's not so much about, I need to do this to eat, and then this, but it's that you always have to be doing that. And I've, I've had older writers tell me it's always ever been thus, that you, no matter how successful you are, you always have to be pushing yourself out there. I think once upon a time I liked Beauty and the Beast on Facebook, because it's true, I do like Beauty and the Beast. <laughs> and um, it's amazing to me when on my news feed it comes up like, like Beauty and the Beast has some post, like, <laughs> like, like, you know, remember when Belle said this? And I'm like, yeah, I do, and it's amazing to me that even Beauty and the Beast, which I think is first of all like not active right now, is not like, a really active property, but it's also like Beauty and the Beast. Like, what else is there to say? Like, it's, it's, like got in a category. Well, I'm actually coming out. Well, I'm actually. Well, that's true. I have to right. generate conversation yeah. just in case. You mean there's the, the, the property is trying to stay present? So yes, it's trying to keep always. the property present. Yeah. Even so, if, it were, if Beauty and the Beast has to stay present, you guys, Beauty and the Beast is hustling. It's like hustling. <laughs> 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 Why don't you go over it? Yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask you, if you have a limited run for a show, maybe a weekend, you know, four days, what, what do you think is the most cost-efficient way to actually promote that? Social media. Yeah. Cost-effective? Yeah. I mean, I mean, uh, I, I taught a business of acting class to students, to, to young actors, and I would say it's the same thing for us, which is that like they, they go like, oh, I want to respect my privacy on Facebook, and like I don't want to, I don't want to accept every friend of us, or like I want to like keep my Twitter private. I'm like, why? I'm like, you have like literally a free billboard that like all of the people that care about the thing that you are doing are your friends. They're requesting you because they want to know more about what you're doing, and if you really want a private life, like don't be on Facebook. You know what I mean? Like, well, I have two different pages. Or don't yeah, I have a <laughs> right. Or don't be like that one. I have a private Facebook page that right. has people I actually know, and then I have a public one that's toward just music, and it's right. um, it's. But I don't tend that one very well. Like I don't I don't keep it up to date as well. So I that's until tonight. Until tonight. Yeah, you know, I'm going to go home and just Facebook about everything. <laughs> um, but I agree with you, Twitter. That there is there's a, a difference. You know how we use social media, but if you're trying to promote something or sell something, then you have right. to you know make it available for the whole world to see. And then don't put pictures of your kids up there. You know? I mean, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. absolutely. We have another question? Yeah. Um, I, you talked earlier at the beginning about how, like, in regional theater, people would just cut scenes, and you sort of thought that was how it was done. And I think there's a very clear line where, like, cutting dialogue and changing words is very wrong. But as Broadway shows get harder and harder, like, how do we know where that line is? A lot of the harmonies are really hard, a lot of the songs are really high, the orchestra parts are monstrous. Like, how did. How, do, how should regional theaters know what to navigate there? Is that the, I mean, I feel like the junior versions have sort of, not only, not only do they simplify a lot of those questions, but they also, there are tracks that you can get, that you, that you can purchase that, 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 I, that create a solution to this problem. I mean, it, it's, and you know, for me, like the, you know, licensing 35 millimeter with you guys, like I thought about that exact same thing. And it's a song cycle, so it can be changed and modified 
Change and modify. I didn't bring it up with you. Change and modify. I thought ahead. I was like, uh, change and modify in so many different ways. And so, like, you know, in the license, I requested a page. It was like, here are all of the many things you can do to change this and simplify. And here are also the things you must never do. These these five things can never happen. But what all of these things can't. What they? What are they? So, like, they can change the gender of any song, but they have to handle all of the transpositions, like they that you know, or or context in French and ask them about that. They can't cut any of the material. They can't cut anything. They also, I like found every word that I perceive to be remotely bad, and like I, there's an alternate lyric for it. I don't want them to. Ch I don't want them to decide what my alternate lyric should be if they don't want to use the F word, and the F word appears a few times. Um, I think, and then instrumentation, that was another thing, like, you know, it's scored for six players, and I basically said, you can either do it with six, or you can do it with two, but you can't cut the cello, because you don't have a cello, mm -hmm. because it's orchestrated for, you know, if the cello's not there, and you're playing from the, the piano book that's supposed to be with this, the, that cello line's gone forever, and, and so, you know, they can do it with piano, piano <coughs> and drums, or you can do it with six players, so, like, things like that are, are for me, the stipulation of this show. Um, and every show I have licensed, I would, I would, I would try to think of all of the situations that could answer all the questions for the, for the uh, amateur license. Well, My I, response to your well, question, I'm sorry, is don't you think they said that when West Side Story came out? And don't no. you think they said that when Sweeney Todd came out? And don't you think they said that when Life at Piazza came out? Like there are certain shows that are game changers because they, those are, those are shows in particular that I think challenge the musicianship of the way people thought about the music before. And I think it probably is true with shows that thought about dramaturgy different, or that you know, acting or, or structure, storytelling differently. But there's something about when you're working at this level. We're all in the Broadway community, whether we're at Broadway shows or off Broadway shows, or we're here in New York. We're sitting at San French because we're working at a heightened level because we would like to be creating the shows that are the game changers. And so, if the show that that somebody is doing on Broadway right now requires you to be a better musician or to educate your students at a higher level, then then that's what you do. Because ten years from now, it won't be the new thing. It'll be. I always think that when. Um, when I first moved to New York, I was playing audition piano, and there would be, like, I just remember Adam Gettle's music in particular, like, the vocal selections would come out, and actors would start bringing it into auditions, and all of us who were playing piano were like, oh my god! <laughs> like, we were studying the cast albums and, like, making sure we knew how they went, but we learned them because that was our job. Because my job is, as an audition pianist, to be able to give you support while, so, you're, so I don't screw up your audition, it's my job. And so it challenged my musicality, it made me a better musician. And I would say that that is what I say out to the people in the world is, if the bar has been raised, you you yeah. try to meet it. Is it okay that the bar has been raised to like needing a click track sometimes though? I think the need for a click track is um, is more about technology and style. If you, I mean, if you, I don't, I don't know why that would be the thing that makes it difficult. If you need a click track because it syncs up with some video element, yeah. Or because it's pop music and pop music is very regimentally based in groove, or you know there are reasons why that might be the case, um, and I would challenge you as a music director to figure out why why that's there. But um, I don't I don't think that the fact that it's harder means that you should be allowed to change it. And I think that with that sort of galvanizing statement, I think that's a great place to. <laughs> Before you go there, I just want to put out there that we uh, Samuel French has put out a line of vocal selection books on our material, some of which would not have gotten a vocal selection book otherwise. Um, Ryan Scott Oliver's 35 millimeter, hold that one. Yeah. 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 Hands on a hard body um, with uh, uh, music and lyrics by Amanda Green, who is a, uh, a uh, Warner Chapel client. Yeah. Hold that. Yeah. Yeah. Also available digital, yes. And um, uh, Natasha Beer and the Great Comet of 1812, Dave Malloy. Fun Home will be out soon. And Fun Home Sheet Music is currently available on our website, uh, both digitally and in print form. So come to SamuelFrench.com and get your sheet music and vocal selection books. Yeah. Thank you guys so much for coming. Thanks to the panel for all of this insight. Have a great evening. Make sure you get the Owning Your Words in the back and sign up on your email list and come back. And also, um, check out, Sean wrote a great article today um, that was posted on HowlRound and the Samuel French online magazine, Breaking Characters. So check those out, and we'll see you guys tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Bye. 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 Bye.
bucks, I'll leave them up here. <laughs>